We're here with Brian McClendon, who's now a research professor at University of Kansas, but also you're running for Secretary of State, so you've got that on your plate now, but most people probably know you as the guy who basically invented Google Earth. Keyhole is what your company was, and that uh, was turned into Google Earth. So uh, a lot of things that you're known for. How did you, tell me, how did you get uh, a love for 3D photography is really where you where mm -hmm. you have your passion. Mm -hmm. So where did that start, and what's your kind of your story getting into that? Uh, well, it started with uh, video games, and I'm old enough that video games uh, of the graphics variety were new mm -hmm. um, in 81, 82, so Pac-Man and Missile Command, I, I enjoyed those a lot, and the pictures, the fact that computers could generate pictures, even if they weren't you know, photographic quality at the time, uh, sort of inspired me, and I wanted to get into both building computers and building computer graphics, and so I ended up doing uh, a career uh, in electrical engineering and, and building computers at Silicon Graphics, which was responsible for Jurassic Park and many of the computer graphics movies of the mid-90s. And uh, that led to seeing that you could visualize the entire globe, which led to mapping, which eventually led to taking a lot of pictures and, uh, and the things that you see now. That's very cool. Now, when you took and uh, you founded Keyhole, and there was a business actually before Keyhole too, That's right. making that leap from building these things, doing engineering, to actually making that into a business, was mm -hmm. that a scary leap for you, or was that just kind of a natural flow for people who are uh, trying to do that? Um, it's, I would say it's scary. It's, you know, whenever you're uh, uh, going out from a big company where the structure is in place and somebody else is responsible for, <laughs> for making the profits and, and paying the bills, to being in a situation where you're trying to convince people to give up those mm -hmm. things and join a company that may or may not be here in a year mm -hmm. or two and uh, change their life and make, take this risk, you have to be pretty certain that the idea is good and that you think you can build a business. And so we were four engineers and we started it. Um, we actually hired a business leader um, to become the CEO of Keyhole. We created Keyhole out of the first startup and we hired a guy named John Hankey, who was an experienced CEO at the time, uh, to create Keyhole. And he raised the money and built upon the software that we had provided him. Mm -hmm. And he also has now uh, turned into a leader in his own right with Niantic Labs and Pokemon Go. Oh wow, that's crazy. So, so that's that's really cool. Would you call yourself like a data geek? Do you love data and looking at it and just organizing it and seeing what you can uh, cull from and glean from it? Absolutely. I, I I look, you know, I try to organize all parts of my life and keep track of uh, all is the things that. Is your life an Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> funnily enough, it is. I, 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 I well, not not Excel. Of right, course, it's sure. Google spreadsheets, yes. and and uh, I like to uh, keep track of the books I've read and the movies I've watched, so I I can see what I've, you know, what what things I really like. So I have my top 40 books that I've ever read, and some people who ask, you know, what what am I interested in, and I can just share the spread that spreadsheet with them. That's very easy. Actually, so, that makes yeah. it very compact. Now, when it comes to data. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess an example would be kind of the healthcare field. For a long mm -hmm. time, we've heard what all this data can do for us, and mm -hmm. it seems like it's just not quite there yet. Yes. What's kind of holding back the data revolution? Because it's slowly coming to different parts, but I feel like it's still getting suppressed in a right. way. So in in the medical area, there's several things that are are restricting it, and uh, one of them. In not not for unreasonable reasons is the privacy needs that you must respect the HIPAA requirements around private data, and you uh, so uh, you know hospitals and even medical records companies like Cerner have to follow very specific rules with how they treat data. So there's limits on what they're able to do. Mm -hmm. um, another challenge is that there's a lot of uh, data. In, in medicine that comes in very numeric form, uh, you know, lab tests and MRIs and, and uh, x-rays that are, can be digitized and figured out. But there's a lot of data in, uh, in the medical system that comes from doctor's notes and nurse's notes. These used to be handwritten. Mm -hmm. um, they're much more now uh, typed in or so forth, but they are not um, structured very strongly and you actually have to interpret the, the okay. words and choices of each nurse and doctor and so one of the challenges that uh, Cerner faces is how to interpret nurses and doctors notes and instructions so that it's consistent across all their patients. Is there, and is that different across hospitals even? Yes. I mean there's a, obviously different terminology. Yes. In my office I call something different than we, we experience that in our mm -hmm. own data. Right. I call University of Kansas one thing with an abbreviation somebody else might call it another. Yes. So that's kind of a big 
big holdup because that's nationwide and worldwide. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and in, the, in the data space, this is called normalization, trying to make all of the data that is describing one thing labeled the same thing. So you have to change it from the you know the unique mm -hmm. uh, flavor that a nurse or a doctor or a hospital provides into a standardized form so that when you do data analysis and try to decide mm -hmm. can we predict this disease earlier or predict an outcome or a risk mm -hmm. that's happening in the hospital that we have the consistent data across patients because the the weight of the patient and the height of the patient those are pretty consistently and accurately measured yeah. but the the day-to-day -day interactions with the patient are not that's interesting and I'm, I'm assuming that would be the same problem with me being able to carry around my own data on a SD card, for example. That's right. Because so, it wouldn't translate. That's right. You, you would have your height and weight, and, the, and the, the next doctor would understand that part, but they might not be able to understand the notes um, with an, as much clarity. They will kind of like interp, uh, interp decode them mm -hmm. um, in their own way, but uh, they may not know the style and code of the, uh, your prior doctor. You have to create some sort of translation program for everything, everything that's kind of similar. And, and, and that is exactly what the companies like Cerner are working on, is figuring out how to translate the uh, consistent but different uh, languages of different hospitals and, and nurses into a, a single normalized language. There are so many applications possible for people. That's right. I think the, the challenge, uh, again, is with this normalization. So especially in education, um, courses that uh, happen in a high school or university sometimes are named the same thing but mean different things. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be this translation table um, for each of the universities. And I, I know some companies that are working in that area. But uh, for small companies, the challenge is that you may not collect the data, right? Um, you, there, you may not think about organizing it, but in many cases, just keeping track of the outcomes for each one of your customers and remembering what you did to do that. So the interaction that provoked the sale, the uh, delivery of the product, the happiness of the customer one month later, whether they bought from you again. Each of these are interesting bits of data that if you have enough of them, you can start to find patterns that will help you inform and make better decisions about how to be a better supplier and a better um, uh, the service for your customers. Yeah, kind of the front end portion of it to make sure everything is, is good on that. So, uh, one thing that happened in Kansas recently, and it's happened so many different places, it happens in healthcare and it takes them a year to realize they've had a data breach. Yes. Um, how do you protect against that? I mean, I mean, is it impossible to protect against and you understand it's just going to happen? Um, I would say, I, I can't say that it's, uh, uh, I mean, I don't think it's impossible, but I don't think it's guaranteed, there's no way to guarantee that it won't happen. Sure. Um, and the challenge, you, I, I would say you need to make sure that the data you have that is privately, personally identifiable, and for example, the social security number is one that we're still trying to protect, although some of the data breaches that have happened have given up most people's social security numbers in other ways. Mm -hmm. But if, if you have that kind of proprietary data, you need to make sure that um, it is not easily transmitted into other areas because usually the computer it's on people are pretty careful about that mm -hmm. it's when it leaves that system mm -hmm. for you know when a report is generated that shows a, a, a subset and that is then emailed to somebody else a lot of the breaches or, or leaks of private data happen when an employee by mistake mails a report out to a customer or to a service provider that contains this information and they shouldn't have done that yeah. but because it had been pulled out of the debatably safe database mm -hmm. into this report it became less protected. So does that make it make the case even more important for visual or identification with fingerprints, identifications like that? Like with my iPhone, I can sit there and you know my thumbprint identifies me. It should it should require that people who have access to this data put their name on the data as it goes by so that it can't be uh, effectively shared without understanding the paper trail of how it happened. Sure. Okay. And when that happens, then employees begin to think much more carefully about, I'm, I'm a steward of this data, yeah. my name is on the, the document, therefore if it gets lost, it'll be my fault. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will help. Uh, keep it at the forefront of all of your employees' minds that uh, that they're holding data that that is in the, in that category. Accountability. Yes. It, it, it goes it goes a pretty long way. Yes. A lot of cities are getting into it now. Kansas City, especially. You've recently talked about that and how they can use it to better equip the city as far as you know traffic engineering and where That's we need right. to change streets or change street lights and things like that. When it comes to that portion of it, the metrics that they use. Mm -hmm. um, 
those need to be accessible probably mm -hmm. to have a lot of eyes on them can people yep. interpret data differently because I'm coming from a sports background mm -hmm. I can make stats work for me to make That's this right. player sound better than this player That's can right. you do the same with data to get a point of view um, the answer is yes right if you if you cherry pick your uh, the results that you like uh, you can uh, send a message one way or another and so the goal really is that if you're going to generate uh, a opinion what you have to do is show here's the data that shows why this intersection needs work and those intersections don't but I'm going to show you the data for all the intersections around mm -hmm. and that way people who are familiar with the actual facts on the ground mm -hmm. can compare their understanding against the data you're showing and they'll see if you've been cherry picking so cherry picking is most dangerous when you really choose three anecdotes and, and you're done right. but if you force a report to cover a broad area then that means a lot more people can provide their own historical experience and check it mm -hmm. and see if see if they think you're cherry picking and at the end of the day there may still be some debate but with enough data it can be an informed debate instead of just uh, guessing what is next for cities and governments and local governments what's next something we're going to do here within the next five years that's mm -hmm. really going to expand us technologically or make us more united i guess in a way mm -hmm. when it comes to data when it comes to sharing ideas and when mm -hmm. it comes to expansion technologically i mean i think that one of the things that i, I tell in my in my speeches is that computers are i like to say approximately free right the hardware to run software on is now not a real cost. It, it is small compared to everything else. The hard problem is the software, but software, if you develop it, can do amazing things. And so if we can get interesting software developed for governments that make them more organized, mm -hmm. they can be more efficient, they can spend less money, yet provide a better customer service to, to their constituents, to the entire population. This is kind of an aside, uh, but just of your time in uh, Silicon Valley, and working with Google and things like that, seeing the trend of these larger companies start to have their own on-site healthcare, is mm -hmm. that going to change things maybe a little bit? Um, I think it, it it puts the incentives in the place where the money is currently spent. So right now, big comp you know, companies of any reasonable size offer health insurance to their employees, and the cost of that health insurance is determined by the health of the employees because you can if you can make them healthier, mm -hmm. then your insurance costs go down. And so, with the right investment. Um, the companies can actually save money. Now I think one of the challenges is that uh, tying health insurance to employment itself is a problem. It has led to some really problematic situations where people who are not tied to a company can't get health care mm -hmm. without you know sure. this, these new systems. And I, th those shouldn't be necessary. Uh, health insurance companies should be marketing to everybody, not just to the group plans of big companies. And or they get sick while they are working, and then they have to miss work, and then right. they lose their job, and That's they right. lose their health insurance, and then and what that, happens? Yeah, and and and, it go, and the price goes up because they're sick when they lose it, and then they they pay uh, you know, for the pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. um, and at the moment, that is supposedly covered, but uh, I think that I think that just not being insured is going to uh, de greatly decrease the health of Americans overall. Interesting. Well, I mean, for right now, if it continues tied with employment, if there is a health and wellness area where they have interesting data that they yep. can, you know, show to insurance companies, these yep. are our people, this is what they're doing, the health yep. and wellness centers, That's right. that might be able to bring down their costs. I, I, yes, absolutely. And I, and I know that they do that. And I know that in many ways they pay for those health and wellness centers by the discounts they get on the, the medical insurance um, uh, that they work with. And some of the biggest companies are self-insured but they still actually can do the math and realize that money spent here saves money on the care side. For people who are in technology, you were in Silicon Valley. I mean, mm -hmm. you were, you know, like in the hot spot that people were like, yeah, I want to be there. Yep. Why come back to Lawrence? <laughs> Why Kansas? Why well, area? Well, I, I, I grew up here. I, I lived here throughout my childhood and I loved the town. I've come back frequently over the years and I have seen that uh, you know, Kansas and Lawrence has just gotten better. Um, it did not go the way of many of uh, many of the problems you read about in um, suburban rural America. You know, Lawrence has improved, and I think that's true now that I've traveled around the state. Several, you know, of the sort of mid-sized cities in, in Kansas are doing very well, um, and I saw the opportunity. You know. 
as a managing manager, I could not work remotely. Uh, management's not something you can do yeah. over video conference. Um, so for 30 years, I couldn't come back. But I finally reached the point where, after looking at real estate for many years, I was able to say, I want to move back and I want to see what I can do to bring all the experience I had mm -hmm in the valley back to Kansas and so I've been working with startups and with engineering students and with high school and grade school mm -hmm. kids on inspiring them to show what you can do with a, a STEM degree. Yeah, I mean you don't have to go to California in order to be successful in technology. You that's see right. that in Lawrence and Kansas City, I mean that's the, there are opportunities here. Absolutely. Very cool. Yeah, there's, there's big employers like Garmin and Cerner, but there's small startups, uh, C2FO, um, Just Play Sports, uh, finding all sorts of very interesting startups coming out of Kansas right now because they're they're coming to me and telling me their stories and the stories are incredible. That's fantastic. Well, thanks.